Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm very honored to chair this session of short lectures on Advait with these two distinguished speakers. First of all, we will have Dr. Hada Hagunatan on the subject, Universal Intelligence is to know the field and the knower of the field, an Advaitic, an Advaitic perspective based on Srimad Bhagavad Gita 13.2. Dr. Dr. Radha Ragunathan is an author, editor, critic, and independent researcher in manuscripts and Advaita Vedanta. She's the director of Sanskrit Department of Adya Library Research Center. She published articles on philosophy in prestigious journals and presented papers as various seminars. She published, published several works, including translations with notes and writes articles and reviews regularly. She's, she was also a guest fac faculty for postgraduate courses in Advaita at Satya Nilayam Chennai. Her interests include building harmony through interfaith and intellectual, intercultural dialogues. Then I invite Brother Hada Ragunathan to deliver you. A very good morning to all of you. And of course, this is uh, the first occasion that I could greet all of you with a very, very happy new year, which I couldn't do earlier. I thank the President, the International Secretary, the Chair, and uh, the Distinguished uh, Speaker, Sri Shankar Bhagavad Pada, and the Distinguished Audience here for coming today to listen to this lectures, short lectures on Advaita Vedanta. And uh, because it is going to be completely focused on Advaita Vedanta, naturally it would require a lot of concentration to listen to it, especially when I am going to talk about universal intelligence from an Advaitic perspective based on Sri Shankaracharya's commentaries. It is going to be a little deeper and naturally more concentration is needed and anyway you will still understand what is being told by the great preceptors. Now, what is intelligence? At the opening session on Sunday morning, Sister Maria Atama, the International Secretary, she introduced our theme and uh, the theme of this convention that we have to explore and understand universal intelligence. And there she said, exploring will open our eyes and understanding leads to wisdom. From that moment onwards till now, till the question answers were over, a lot has been discussed on what is intelligence, what is knowledge, what is wisdom. 
and I don't think I can add more. And yet, I have to begin somewhere, begin my talk somewhere, and therefore let me add a few words on this intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. It is common practice that we use these terms, intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom, as if they are synonyms, and we use them interchangeably also, and that's not wrong. Because they are overlapping, and one includes the other, one leads to the other, and it's always in, in interconnected. So there's nothing wrong, and yet there could be some fine distinctions. And uh, let me try to my, the best of my understanding. Intelligence is an innate characteristic. It is an inborn quality. It is the skill to analyze and perceive. Knowledge is the perception and understanding of facts about a certain topic, whatever topic that we are dealing with. And this knowledge is acquired through learning and practice. We study more and more about a subject, about a topic, we acquire more knowledge about that subject or that topic. And wisdom is the ability to discern and use this acquired knowledge intelligently. But intelligence is limited in measure. Even through a hundred years of my lifetime, I cannot increase the measure of the intelligence that I'm born with. It's a given. On the other hand, knowledge is ever expanding. I can go on adding and adding and adding to my previous knowledge, adding a variety to whatever I already know, and that can go on even if you know for more than 100 years of my lifetime. And wisdom is to make appropriate use of one's limited intelligence to draw from that vast source of knowledge. Now, coming to the word intelligence, I'm going to talk in terms of Sankhya and Advaita Vedanta. This apparatus, the mental apparatus, is called what we call the Antakrana. That is the, uh, we can translate it as a, a subtle internal organ. It is an internal organ, but it is very subtle, therefore we say the subtle internal organ. And it takes, it does four different functions according to the needs of any incident or occasion. And therefore, we refer to the same internal organ with four different names. The emoting, that is that part of it, that, that when the mind, when that internal organ is functioning with emotions, it is the emoting faculty and it is called the mind at that time, manas. And that is why I feel the happiness, sorrow, uh, and goodness, badness, all this at that time. And the discriminating faculty is called the intellect, buddhi. The egotistic faculty is called the ego, or the I notion, ahankara. And then we have the memory faculty, which is called impressions, called chitta. And intelligence, it is a characteristic of the discriminating faculty called intellect, buddhi. And wisdom is a characteristic of the experience, that is the impressions that are gathered over time, either through my intelligence or through my knowledge. Now, the term, what is meant by this universal intelligence? The term universal itself suggests that it is present in all beings, at all times, and at all places. And here we see that all religions, all faiths, all cultures, all scriptures speak about this intelligence about this universal intelligence and its all per pervasiveness. Now let me take up with the Bible. There are several versions of the Bible and I am just taking up this version from the New Living Translation of John 17, 23 
and this is uh, what it says. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience, they means all the people, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, now is this Jesus who is speaking, that you sent me, that you love them as much as you love me. Now this is a prayer by Jesus to God, the Father. And he is praying for a perfect unity among his own disciples and for a perfect unity between the disciples and God. We have a similar verse, uh, uh, portion in the Gita in uh, chapters, in chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, where Krishna, I'm not uh, quoting the actual verses, but where he conveys, I am in all the beings, and all the beings are in me. So in both these instances, we are seeing two supreme principles. One principle is a supreme absolute, the most abstract. And the other is the supreme principle, but relatable. For example, when Jesus prays to God, Jesus is the supreme principle to whom we are able to relate through the words in the Bible or through all the stories that we hear about Jesus. But the Father that he is praying to is the supreme absolute principle. Similarly, in the Bhagavad Gita, when Lord Krishna uses the word I and me in these verses 9, 4 and 9, 5, there we have to understand that Krishna is speaking as the relatable supreme principle. Whereas in uh, Vedanta, the absolute supreme principle is termed Brahman. So, let me now give you a small brief account of what Vedanta, uh, Advaita Vedanta is. We all know Advaita means non-dualism. And non-dualism means what? Oneness. There is no second. And this philosophy of oneness is founded on what we call Mahavakyas. They can be broadly translated, I mean, almost translated as the great statements or great sayings. And only those statements which are found in the Upanishads. And what are those great statements? They talk about the identity of the individual self with that supreme Brahman. So, we have these Mahavakyas like Tat Tvam Asi, that Brahman you are. Or it says Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And then at the most profound, this one it says, I am Atma, this self is Brahman. And all those Mahavakyas, they establish the identity of this individual self which we refer to as Jivatman with that supreme self Brahman which we refer to as the Paramatman, that is the supreme self. But the individual self, this Jivatman thinks that it is different from that absolute self. Today we had that question on the human intelligence and the universe in intelligence and so much was going on as to the part and the whole, all those. Why, why, do, why does this Jivatman feel that it is different? It is due to its ignorance of its essential nature as Brahman. We shall soon see some definitions of what that Brahman is. And that applies to the Atman in the Jiva also. And this ignorance of one's own true nature, it is called self-ignorance. It is because about one's own self. And therefore it is called Atma, Atma, Atma Ajnana or Atma Avidya. Atma Ajnana or Atma Vidya. And it is not Atma Jnana, Atma Vidya. That is self-knowledge. I am talking about the contrary. And this self-ignorance, it works in 
two ways. First, it covers the na true nature of myself. It covers it with the power of covering, the power of veiling. It is called Avarana Shakti. And simultaneously, uh, very quickly, instantaneously, it projects something which is different from my real nature. And that, through the power of projection, and that is called the Vikshepa Shakti. So, due to this veiling by the, by the ignorance, which is avidya or ajnana, this individual self, this jivatman, it forgets its real nature. And due to the projection of the differences, it begins to imagine, it begins to think of all the limitations, all the possible limitations and the impossible, all imagined limitations also about the self. Yes, it is true, we go through limitations, but that has to be because uh, it is brought about by this uh, um, Ajnana at a later time, uh, just a, a little later I will tell you that it is Maya at the cosmic level. We are going to go through it, we all go through it, we will always go through it because of the work of this Maya, because that's what it is doing all the time to us. Even when I'm talking, it is Maya which is making me talk. Right? Brahman is not going to do anything. Brahman is non-doer, akarta. It will not make me talk. It is Maya which makes me talk. But it is Maya again which is going to make me talk about universal intelligence. We have this in the Bible also. The Satan, the fallen angel, can talk about God. It happens. That's a different thing. Now, because of this ignorance, this jivatma, this individual self, it feels shackled. It feels helpless. It feels shackled in this mire of samsara, the cycle of birth and death, transmigration, all that. And this is an internal limitation. Externally, what the Jeevatman does is to see the world outside it, which is just names and forms. The Chandogya Upanishad says that. It is mere names and forms. Okay. And all of which, all these names and forms are but projections of Maya. At that level, at the cosmic level, we call this ignorance as Maya. And we will see, Maya is nothing but Prakriti. Now, according to Advaita Vedanta, I am never shackled. I am never free. This eternal freedom, this moksha or mukti, is one's own real nature. That is Brahman. Brahman is ever free, never shackled. No associations, asanga, no delusions. And this means one need not wait until death to feel free, to fear, to enjoy that freedom. I don't have to look forward to going to another higher world like uh, Swarga Loka or Brahma Loka or any other Loka to start enjoying this freedom. One only needs to realize it and start and begin to enjoy this freedom which is my real nature. But to realize it, one must know the profound message conveyed through the Mahavakyas in the Upanishads, the statements, there are treatises also which will aver, affirm that the Jeevatman and Paramatman are but one Brahman and all projections are not real. They are all apparent. And to know this, like the vice president mentioned, one must go to the masters. Let us not try anything on our own because it's going to lead to more confusions, more misconceptions, more delusions. Best thing is to go and study this under the realized masters who know how to guide us. They know what, how much should be fed into our heads, how to feed them, and when to withdraw. I can uh, recall one uh, small uh, instance from my own life when I was a little girl learning cycling, and my father was actually trying to push me, on the, he was holding the bike be uh, behind me, and he was pushing me, and I was very happy. But somewhere along, 
I realized that there was no push happening. And when I realized it, that my father had long stopped somewhere, in that fright, I just let the bike straight down to a pit. <laughs> right? You need that guide. But that guide cannot be there with you all the time. The guide can only guide you to the door. It is for me to explore beyond that door. I have to enter. He can take me up to the entrance and from there on it is my journey. Anyway, now regarding this Advaita Vedanta, the school of Advaita Vedanta was systematized by uh, Gaudapadacharya. There have been uh, uh, Advaita preceptors much, much, much before Gaudapadacharya. We have uh, names like Dravida, Tanka, and uh, so many people, but uh, it was, if we see the first uh, uh, significant systematic work with uh, the Mandukya Karika of uh, Gaudapadacharya in the 6th or 7th century. And then there have been a lot of preceptors, names unknown. And then we have the most prominent among them, uh, Shankaracharya in uh, the 8th century. And then there have been several preceptors after Shankaracharya till date. And my prayer was to my guru who comes in that lineage of all the pre preceptors of Advaita Vedanta. So Vedanta, whether it is Advaita Vedanta or Visitadvaita Vedanta or Advaita Vedanta, it has to have an unbroken lineage of preceptors. And we go and learn under them. And Advaita Vedanta, thus we see, has grown firmly rooted and naturally over all these centuries it is going to branch out into sub-schools and the two most significant sub-schools -sub are Bhamati and Vivarana. Now Shankaracharya, he wrote his commentaries on uh, the major Upanishads as well as the Brahma Sutras and there have been other preceptors who wrote their sub-commentaries on Shankaracharya's commentaries. Notably on his commentary on the Brahma Sutra. And there we have two important uh, sub-commentaries. One is called the Bhamati sub-commentary, the other is the Vivarana sub-commentary on Shankaracharya's Brahma Sutra commentary. And that is how we have two main branches of Advaita Vedanta and they go on branching out till today. But all these sub-schools of Advaita Vedanta they are all unanimously founded on the foundation, the founder, the core, that Brahman is the only reality and anything other than Brahman is not real. And the word, the technical word for that in Advaita Vedanta is Mithya. Many people try to translate it as a delusion or imagination and uh, so many uh, illusions, so many other terms, but it doesn't really convey it when we look at the definition of mithya. It is neither real nor unreal, in, uh, neither describable nor undescribable. Therefore, the word mithya is used as mithya in all our words, though we try to explain it a bit. Now, because Brahman is the only reality, let me talk a little about what is Brahman. We have many definitions of Brahman in the Upanishads. And for our, the purpose of our theme, universal intelligence, let me concentrate on those definitions which define Brahman as intelligence. Most importantly, we have Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. And it is from the Taitri Upanishad. And from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, we have Vijnanam, Anandam, Brahman. From the Aitareya Upanishad, we have the Mahavakya, oh, sorry, the, um, this one, uh, uh, Brahman's definition as Pragnanam, Brahma. In all these definitions, Brahman is defined as intelligence, but it doesn't stop there. In the definitions, also give the sin, as if they are synonyms. They say that this Brahman is synonymous with existence. Existence, the words in this uh, that we saw is Satu and Satyam. 
and ananta infinity brahman is infinity and brahman is ananda satyam jnanam uh, that is when we say satyam jnanam anantam brahma there it is infinity when we say sat chit ananda brahman there that ananda means the bliss and then it talks about brahman being awareness when we say vijnanam brahma it means awareness pragnanam brahma also means awareness and the upanishads declare that the knower of brahman becomes brahman that is from the mundaka upanishad uh, mundaka upanishad the knower of brahman becomes brahman now here there is a lot of uh, interpretations going on between various schools of vedanta but in advaita vedanta we do not talk about becoming as if you know it is a different even because it's uh, brahman who is my real nature and therefore this becoming that is uh, the bhavati that is uh, um, yo brahma veda sah brahma eva bhavati one who knows brahman he is brahman indeed that is how we say that means he is brahman we don't say he becomes brahman we say he is brahman and so we now come to the next point of universal intelligence represented by the word ishvara now uh, uh, dr deepa padi the vice president was talking about uh, the sankhya system in our talk on monday advaita vedanta adapts the sankhya system of evolution the starting point of evolution is when the two principles of purusha i am t- uh, taking from the sankhya uh, this one for now and then we will proceed according to advaita the starting point of evolution is when the purusha and prakriti come closer now the purusha is the unchanging sentient consciousness principle it is the absolute principle non changing principle prakriti is the changing insentient matter principle and it is the prakriti which has the three gunas of sattva rajas and tamas and that is what the combinations of the sattva rajas tamas the domination of one over the other is what causes the variety of whatever we are experiencing internally and externally and when we say the word gunas that they have the three gunas this word guna is wonderful in vedanta because it has at least two meanings one meaning means qualities when i talk about sattva rajas and tamas it means those three qualities or but the same word guna can also mean a roop this prakriti is the one which is instrumental in tying me like a rope in roping me into this samsara we have the word pasha which is also rope okay and what happens is these three gunas they bind us like a rope to all other uh, experiences in life and to the cycle of transmigration the school of wisdom held some online classes in uh, 2022 and there we studied a text called tatva bodha where we studied this evolution in detail and there tatva bodha is a primary text for all advaita students there we saw the evolution of the 24 cosmic principles these 24 cosmic principles are adapted from the sankhya system and sankhya system is a dualistic philosophy where purusha and prakriti are two independent principles real principles eternal principles whereas in advaita vedanta brahman is the only principle and anything other than brahman is not real is not absolutely true and there we began the discussion on creation by first understanding what maya is and what is the cosmic self in vedanta i said this purusha is termed brahman 
and prakriti has the synonyms of maya, avidya, ajnana, and so on. Now, like I said, according to the Sankhya system, evolution happens when the purusha and prakriti come closer to each other. Whereas in Advaita Vedanta, there is no need for anything to move anywhere. The mere presence of Brahman is enough for this prakriti to start working and throwing up its magic. So, that is why in Sankhya system, we say that uh, transformation, that is the evolution, is a real transformation of uh, that uh, prakriti. Whereas in Advaita Vedanta, Brahman does not undergo any change. It is Maya which is throwing up so many visions before me. And therefore, this is apparent transformation. And it's important for me to understand this difference, to know that whatever I'm dealing with is all appearances. You may be wondering why am I talking so much about uh, this uh, evolution here? Because I need to understand what the universal intelligence is behind this whole creation. If I understand that this whole thing is an apparent uh, existence, this creation, because it is ever changing. It is never well, no, state, static. It is dynamic all the time. And it is always throwing up surprises. And therefore in Advaita we say that creation is an apparent evolution, apparent transformation. It is called Vivarta. And in all this, the same all-pervading infinite absolute intelligence which we called Nirguna Brahman, that is a Brahman without any gunas, without any attributes. But with the adjunct called Maya, I will just tell you what adjunct means. It is called, that Brahman, when it is with the adjunct Maya, that Brahman is called Ishwara. Adjunct means something that is adventitious, that is not inherent, it is not Maya, a, a quality that is permanent. Now, Ishwara, he uses this Maya to assume the countless forms in this creation. Now, similarly, we have this Maya, which is an insentient principle. And here we say, because Ishwara is there, the Ishwara is both the efficient cause and the material cause also, the unchanging material cause, because Brahman is the unchanging, but anything should come only from Brahman, it needs the blessing of Brahman. And we give the example of a spider from whose body comes out the web. That is an example of a single creation. But a dreamer, he throws up so many things in his dream. A dreamer is an example of creation of many things. Now, Ishwara is like that. So, when we say that creation is apparent, this is because Brahman is a non-doer and he is changeless. And uh, when this Brahman, I said when Brahman is with Maya, we refer to that Brahman as Ishwara or Paramatman. When Brahman is with all our sheets, our three bodies and our experiences, we refer to the same Brahman as Jivatma. So, if we think very deeply, there is nothing outside Ishwara, there is nothing other than Ishwara and uh, therefore there is nothing other than that. Brahman, which is mentioned in Tatu Tvam Asi. And uh, let me skip a few things. I think it is... Uh, okay, I see. So, now how do we know? Now this Bra Ishwara is what? Uh, before that, I would like, just like to uh, give you a short introduction here. Uh, there is a text called Vedanta Sanyavali, which gives uh, all the definitions of uh, the terms used in Advaita Vedanta and all the uh, concepts that uh, are used in Advaita Vedanta. 
and uh, I am actually uh, translating that work uh, with uh, my commentary, Radha Prakashika, on it. So from there, I am just going to quote that this Brahman, when it is with Maya, because it picks up the attribute, that is, we are talking in terms of the attributes, Brahman with attributes. Then we call it Saguna. Saguna means with attributes. And there it is said, the Saguna Brahman is threefold with the names Virat, Hiranyagarbha and Maheshwara. And some of the scholars, they call these three, the Virat as the gross or personal form, Murta form of Brahman, the Hiranyagarbha as a subtle or impersonal form of Brahman and the Maheshwara or Ishwara as the undifferentiated Avyakrita form of Brahman. And that is how they correspond to the Virat, Hiranyagarbha and Maheshwara respectively. And when we are talking about universal intelligence, let us remember Brahman is pure intelligence. We are not able to relate to it. So what comes next is when Maya comes in, there is the Ishwara which comes with the all the intelligence that is now going to, is ready to be expressed and that is the universe, the cosmic intelligence that we are talking about. At the next stage is this Hiranyagarbha which is an inferior form of Ishwara where it is now in association with the cosmic ego and that is why it loses its omniscience a little. And finally we have the Virat which is the gross form of this universal intelligence which we are able to enjoy. And uh, how do we know that uh, this uh, exists, Brahman exists? In the Taitriya Upanishad, Shankaracharya, he raises his question and he gives seven proofs for the existence of Brahman. And then he is asking this question, three questions are raised there. Does Brahman exist? He gives seven proofs. And second question raised there is, Assuming that Brahman exists, will an ignorant person merge in Brahman? And the third question is, assuming that Brahman exists, will a realized person, enlightened person, merge in Brahman? And then, finally, after a lot of discussion, Shankaracharya says, the questions themselves are wrong. That's what he says. The questions are themselves wrong because the questions are relevant only when the Agnani, that is the ignorant person, or the wise person is different from Brahman and we are not. We are not different from the cosmic intelligence. We are not different from the universal intelligence. It is only my limitation which makes me feel that I am different. And so, uh, I will just give me uh, two minutes, two more minutes and I'll finish. Oh, one minute. Okay. Now, uh, there are a lot of... Uh, quotations that we can see, a lot of instances we can see in the Bhagavad Gita which uh, affirm this. But uh, before I finish, I would like to uh, just talk about one, two verses uh, from how to tap this uh, okay. mm. This is one prayer from the Psalm of David. I'm not going to read the prayer for you, but it's a very beautiful prayer. I always enjoy it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now let me just tell you what happens is it, what hap how I look at this uh, look at this prayer. No doubt the Lord is the shepherd. A shepherd knows how to tend to his sheep. And those sheep have to trust him. Only then. And the shepherd knows how to lead them to safe areas for grazing. And he protects them from all the predators too. And this is true of Ishwara too. This is true of the universal intelligence. This is true of the cosmic intelligence. And if I go by the Mahavakya, I am Brahman, then I am the shepherd myself. And what are my sheep? They are my sense organs and this internal organ. That is the four faculties. And I should know how to control them, how to manage them. And uh, what Taitri Upanishad says, 
an enlightened person who has realized the bliss of Brahman has nothing to fear. Once I've done that, I can go on drawing from this inner source of Ananda. And uh, here, Shankaracharya also gives a beautiful prayer, but I would like to conclude with uh, what uh, Swami Vivekananda says on uh, universal intelligence. He says, where it begins, there it ends. What is the end of this universe? Intelligence, is it not? The last to come in the order of creation, according to the evolutionists, was intelligence. But we say it is the first. In the beginning itself, Mahat, straight away, Mahat and then Hiranyagarbha, straight away we say. That being so, it must be the cause. The beginning of creation also. At the beginning, that intelligence remains involved. And in the end, it gets evolved. The sum total of the intelligence displayed in the universe must therefore be the involved universal intelligence unfolding itself. And this universal intelligence is what we call God, what we call Brahman in Advaita. We call Ishwara, if I want to be relate to that Brahman. From whom we come and to whom we return, as the scriptures say. Call it by any other name. You cannot deny that in the beginning there is that infinite cosmic intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Hada Hagunathan for his profound, her profound speech. And now I will invite Brother Sankara Bhagavad Pada. He is an Hindu teacher of Yana Yoga and commentator of the lifetime work of J. Krishnamurti. He is also a consultant Vedic astrologer for the last 23 years. Currently, Dr. Sankara teaches Hindu spiritual disciplines. In the late 2021, he started offering Amanaska Yoga as one year long online course, which is his commentary on the world's teacher's lifetime work. This is a culmination of his lifetime work. His teachings are offered through a variety of media, including interactive video conferencing sections and set sangs. Notably, Dr. Sankara led a panel discussion in the 2018 Parliament of the World's Religion for Interreligious Harmony and World Peace, self knowing is sine qua non. Then, Dr. Sankara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, namaste to all the delegates in this uh, August gathering of the 148th uh, International Convention of the Theosophical Society. Uh, salutation to the international president, Mr. Tim Boyd, and uh, uh, the international secretary and the international treasurer and the international vice president and all the delegates uh, and all the seekers. I've been attending a few sessions here and uh, I discovered that there are uh, very many noble souls in this gathering and uh, therefore um, I am humbled by their presence and I am going to uh, present a viewpoint uh, of Advaita, self-knowing and universal intelligence uh, not as though 
I am uh, talking in a Hindu ashram, either in one of the muts of the Shankaracharya, but I am talking in the context of the Theosophical Society, uh, which has uh, been in existence for about 150 years. So uh, I am embedding the, uh, the whole theme uh, in that context. Now the first uh, observation I like to make uh, is that the first line of founders of the Theosophical Society, uh, namely Madame Blavatsky and uh, Colonel uh, Henry Steele Alcott, they started this uh, society with an impossibly vast intention. And if we actually think about it, and see what the first line of founders have achieved. Not as an egoistic achievement, but achievement for the welfare of the planet, for the welfare of mankind. And brought to fruition and brought to fulfillment by the second line of leaders, Mrs. Annie Besant and Charles W. Leadbeater. Um, we will see that uh, this is actually an impossible miracle which they have created in the religious sphere. It is not a miracle in science and technology, but it's a miracle in the realm of consciousness and awareness and in the domain of the religions. Now, they said that there is no religion higher than truth. Now, this is a very enigmatic statement, and unfortunately, we don't have the time uh, to delve very deeply uh, into this uh, uh, sutra, which is a new sutra. Formerly in the Indic religions, the so-called truth had an absolute quality and it was enshrined in the sanctum sanctorum of the Indic religions. But in Madame Blavatsky's perception, you can see that she has taken the truth outside the domain of the religions and she has placed it uh, in the lofty clouds and said that it has to be a magnificent benchmark for all the religions to live up to. Now there is something uh, tremendous, a new line of thought, an altogether uh, new perception, and uh, we can go on wondering about it uh, for years and years. And at this international uh, convention, what is very significant is that as though the uh, Theosophical Society in the here and now, under the leadership of the international president, uh, they have somehow um, made a, a revisitation of the original vast intention of the first line of founders. And um, the first line of founders, the intention is being rekindled and revisited. That is the feeling that uh, I have. Now, uh, you can see, uh, yes, I've been through that. Now you can see the founders and... Uh, um, these founders um, are very, very great. And I want to focus attention uh, on the first line of founders and the second line of leaders, starting with Mrs. Annie Besant and Bishop Leadbeater. And uh, my whole uh, presentation of Advaita, self-knowing and universal intelligence used to be understood uh, in the context of the history of the Theosophical Society. Hmm? That's my... Uh, uh, that's why. So I covered that. And uh, the Theosophical Society envisioned, the founders envisioned, the four great uh, people, they envisioned um, uh, Himalayan masters, masters of the Theosophical Society, who are like the Maharshis uh, for the Hindus. They are sages and they are seers. And they may not be uh, in flesh and in blood, uh, in a body, but definitely they have an ethereal presence in other planes of consciousness which is assigned uh, to the Himalayan range. And it was the intention of the founders uh, to work uh, in collaboration with the intention of the masters themselves so that um, Lord Maitreya, who is one of the masters, who is, uh, was held to be, uh, uh, who was held to have incarnated as uh, Jesus Christ and held to have incarnated as Bhagavan Krishna. 
is going to incarnate again uh, for the betterment of the world and to purify and ennoble the world. That was the intention, impossibly vast intention as we dream about it and as we think about it. And the Theosophical Society set out uh, to search for an appropriate pure vehicle which the master Maitreya will initially um, um, inhabit and then he will blend into the consciousness of that human and uh, that uh, human being was J. Krishnamurti. Now there was 20 years uh, during which the Theosophical Society, especially Annie Besant and uh, Bishop Leadbeater, they worked to groom uh, Krishnamurti for the future role of the world teacher. That was their assignment. And Annie Besant did not gloss over and did not forget uh, the vision of the first line of founders. And she brought to fulfillment the vision of the first line of founders by working very, very hard. And uh, um, Bishop Leadbeater was an uh, extremely significant individual in the discovery of uh, J. Krishnamurti and in creating the whole phenomena of the world teacher. But then um, the difference between earth and heaven is uh, in earth many things uh, go wrong suddenly and a climax, an expected climax can turn out to be an anti-climax and then a new beginning has to be made. That is how earthly life is. And notwithstanding uh, Krishnamurti parting company with the Theosophical Society after being groomed for 20 years uh, in the uh, home and cradle and matrix of the Theosophical uh, Society, uh, a chasm developed between the world teacher uh, who was uh, now out into the open world and uh, because the Theosophical Society did not concur uh, with the outlook of the uh, world teacher. The perceptions uh, were divergent. They went in different directions. Uh, and Krishnamurti went on uh, to, uh, to give the teachings to the world. It is a paradigm shifted uh, teachings. And those teachings uh, uh, were uh, flowing like a river for 70 long years, for seven full decades. And uh, you can see in these pictures You can see uh, Krishnamurti with his brother uh, Nitya, younger brother, in the lower picture. And then uh, uh, Bishop Ledbeta seated in the center and uh, Krishnamurti and Annie Besant on either side. And so the association is far too deep. But then something happened, a rupture happened, and uh, Krishnamurti walked out of the Theosophical Society. He disbanded the Order of the Star in the East, and it was a, a, a difficult reconciliation for both the uh, world teacher uh, who was in the process of invert flowering and also for the mother matrix of the Theosophical Society, with, which gave birth uh, to the whole phenomenon of the world teacher. Uh, now, I begin uh, with uh, uh, three intangible words, and I added the adjective uh, intangible because the three words, self-knowing, Advaita, and universal intelligence, they do not point to any sense object which we can go and touch and feel the reality of them. Uh, Advaita and universal intelligence refer to a transcendental reality uh, which is not accessible uh, to man's uh, sensory perceptions. And self-knowing uh, is the new paradigm of the world teacher, Krishnamurti. And through self-knowing, uh, the essence of the new teaching uh, is that through self-knowing, you are supposed to go home uh, to the divine. Uh, you are supposed to uh, go into the transcendental realm uh, where, uh, the, uh, where the ethos is Advaita where the air is Advaita and where the truth is Advaita and the universal intelligence uh, is the new uh, fragrant uh, perfume of benediction, of grace, uh, which, will, uh, um, which will come into the life of those people uh, who as seekers and adventurers dare to go so far within themselves in an inner pilgrimage. 
Um, now, Advaita and universal intelligence point to uh, ultimate reality, which has got a very special name uh, in the Indic religions. And the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, they refer to that ultimate reality as Tat, that. Why did they say that and gave importance to the demonstrative pronoun? Because anything else you describe becomes this, what we can know by sense of touch, through optical perception, through auditory perception, all of that, the, our entire human world is this, it can be touched. Whereas that is absolutely unapproachable, hmm? but all the same it exists for real and that is the essence of the understanding uh, which we need to uh, develop. Now, in this whole uh, meditative journey, uh, we have to re realize at the very beginning that the terminal destination uh, is beyond the reach of the senses and uh, the mind or consciousness, and uh, it is held to be unknowable. The destination is unknowable, but it exists nevertheless, and there will be um, a proof which you will have to uh, search for and which you will have to glean from the mysterious uh, uh, terminal destination. Now, now we begin the inquiry, the exploration and the inquiry uh, to understand universal intelligence. Now, all human beings uh, have uh, two natures. We have a limited nature, an imperfect nature, uh, and a survival-oriented nature, uh, which I like to describe by the word self. Now, this self is not the self of the Bhagavad Gita and of the Upanishads. Uh, this is the traditional name for that, Jivatma, that is it's the individual uh, self. And to set it apart from the Upanishadic self and the Vedantic self, I have put it in bold and I have italicized it and I put it in lowercase. So it signifies uh, the movement of individuality and the movement of uh, the self within the human consciousness. Now, that has got various very definitive hallmarks which all of us can testify, especially those who have turned inward. They can very easily uh, concur with me and they can say, yes, we have observed and we have no difficulty in agreeing with you even though uh, it's a difficult pill to swallow in the beginning. Now, it's nature, it is self-protective, it is self-defensive, it is self-centered, and it has got uh, the disease of wanting to be separate, and it has not only got the disease of wanting to be separate, but also in the divine architecture of things, uh, it has uh, got to deal uh, with that separation uh, which is there ab initio right from the very beginning. And then it's got a mentality of being divisive, it is acquisitive, it is secretive, it is suspicious, it is combative, it is aggressive. And this is the self we have to uh, realize is who we are at the beginning of the journey. This is all that we know. Now, uh, beyond this, uh, very deeply nestled within ourself uh, is another domain of the human consciousness not allowed to come into manifestation because it is veiled and pressurized by the hectic activity of the self which is the cacophony it's all the time happening that is too much of cerebration too much of self-defensive thinking and too much of confusion and because of that, the deeply nestled, radiantly godly nature and the divine nature has no chance uh, to break through the closed gates and manifest in our day-to-day -day life. But if the cacophony and the noise in the top layer uh, can, be, uh, can subside and it can be brought to naught, then the more deeply nestled godly nature, the divine nature, uh, will manifest as... Uh, Love manifests as compassion, manifests as awareness, which is also intelligence, and manifests as 
a timeless nature of ourselves and an incorruptible self and in the language of the scriptures uh, it is chaitanya and it is atma and it is aham and that particular word aham is very significant because etymologically it means the first alphabet of the sanskrit language and the last alphabet and therefore it encompasses the totality of creation so the the really deep self that we have uh, which comes uh, which gives evidence of its existence and evidence of its reality the moment the cacophony subsides then that is a kind of mother of the totality of creation uh, all the planets all the galaxies and uh, the whole of creation and the miracle of life on planet earth everything exists on the breast of the divine mother and that exists as aham in our consciousness and the gita uh, has a certain chapter chapter 2 uh, where uh, bhagavan krishna he introduces to arjuna a certain uh, magnificent state of human consciousness called that of sthita prajna the sthita prajna is one who effortlessly abides in the timeless now he is not rocked by distracting thoughts he is not pulled away from that position of equilibrium in the now by sensory distraction by various kinds of sensory infatuations by desires by sorrow he is ever rooted very deeply and sthita the adjective means that which is stable that which is consolidated that which is not flickering and that which is not uh, uh, frivolous and that which is not changeful but timeless so there is an intelligence prajna is that universal intelligence which the theosophical society is uh, discussing at the 148th uh, international convention uh, prajna is both the awareness and prajna is also that supreme intelligence that supreme intelligence is available in the sthita prajna because in him the mind has been shut down it's not active it will act when there is a challenge uh, when there is uh, when you want food and the body is hungry uh, then uh, you will go and tell your mother uh, or somebody please give me some food and ramana maharshi said in tirunamalai uh, as a liberated sage when he was only about Uh, 18 years old he said i am very proud to go and uh, beg for food i feel like a king he said when i go and ask for food and because he is uh, in that not only in the sthita prajna state where uh, thoughts and desires and afflictions cannot intrude uh, into that clearing they can't get there there is only stillness there and there is bliss there and uh, that is the sthita prajna state introduced in the second chapter of the bhagavad gita and such a person whether such a person can fit into mainstream society that is a thing which we have to discuss later hmm? but uh, the sthita prajna's next assignment is to discover ultimate reality uh, and the source of the intelligence which is enshrined in him and which is available to him at every beck and call it's available to him but if he wants to uh, plumb the depths of that then the that comes in the second milestone and the bhagavan krishna says that he has to discover the ultimate uh, reality or the unmanifest uh, divine so there are only two milestones in the spiritual journey one is the milestone of being a sthita prajna the second is the milestone of discovering parabrahma or the unmanifest divine there is nothing else in the spiritual journey so st- milestone 1 and milestone 2 and uh, um if uh now the default setting we have all of us human beings uh, we have a default setting uh, in which there is separation there is sorrow there is divisiveness now this is the only thing that we know and we have to start from here from this default setting and see if we can uh, reach the terminal destination uh, which the upanishads describe as that so that is our assignment and uh, before we embark on that assignment uh, we have to be honest enough and we have to say uh, uh, especially all of us in whom thought is excessively active thought is uh, doing 
uh, more of work than what is called for uh, in uh, intelligent and wise living. So because of that hectic activity of thought, uh, we will uh, have to see that that has led to no freedom, no clarity, and no intelligence, but only abundant confusion, abundant conflict, and sorrow in every relationship. So this is uh, a result of the default setting, and therefore the default setting is not a happy thing at all. And therefore it is given to us uh, now to overwrite on the default setting. Now, uh, if we are passive and we do not make any effort in order to overwrite on the default setting, then the default setting will be as it is, and that is the state of original sin. Hmm? In biblical terms, that is the state of original sin. That is, Adam and Eve have been driven out of the Garden of Eden. We have all, all of us have been driven out of the Garden of Eden. And the question is, can we regain the lost paradise? That's the whole question for us. And to regain the lost paradise uh, is to go back home to that. Not ideologically, not idealistically, but actually whether we can do that. So that's the assignment for us. And that is the question uh, that the Theosophical Society has posed for all of us on the occasion of the 148th uh, convention uh, that can we explore and can we discover uh, the seat of this uh, uh, universal uh, intelligence? Can we understand it? Uh, can we become comfortable with it? Can it become our life breath? That's the assignment for us. And uh, going back to the tradition, uh, the tradition says... that that cannot be approached by any thought. If you have devotion to the divine, that is not good enough to approach that. Uh, if you do any sadhana, that entire sadhana is only getting away from that. Because the sadhana entails becoming. And every becoming, that sadhana may have a certain fruit, we'll come to that later, but every sadhana is more activity in thought and feeling. And the more activity we perpetuate in thought and feeling, the more we are straying away and wandering away from that where no activity can happen. So we are warned by self-realized masters and by the sages who have given us the Upanishads and all the scriptures that rarifying and emptying the whole field of consciousness leading up to the vacant mind, that is the assignment for us, whether we can do that and how do we do that. And uh, so when we do that, we come to the vacant mind by rarifying and emptying. Uh, then uh, that is virgin ground. That is a state of unknowingness. That is a state of innocence. That is exactly the condition of Adam and Eve when they were in the Garden of Eden and Manu and Shatarupa, similarly in the Hindu tradition. So that is the one and only homework all human beings have to embark on. There is no other assignment. Bread and butter is a trifling small assignment. It can easily be met with because we do have that intelligence. That is not the purpose and the summum bonum of life. The summum bonum is can we uh, uh, go back and find out what is our origin? Can we find out uh, what is our mysterious connection to the unmanifest divine? That is the only assignment and that assignment is called moksha. Now, the traditional religions, they start with the divine. They are totally blind to the self, the self that I uh, revealed to you. And it is Krishnamurti who said that he will not put the spotlight on the divine. He will much rather put the spotlight on the self because he pointed out that the self is evil and therefore there has to be an ending of that evil in our lives. And uh, that evil is the source of division. That evil is the source of separation. And uh, it is a, a source of much mischief in thought and feeling. And therefore, can that whole activity, can it come to a grinding halt? That's the assignment for us. And Krishnamurti, because he represents uh, a new teaching and the paradigm shift, he's the new world teacher. Therefore, he said, start with the self and start observing uh, every uh, movement of the self. And when you keep on observing every movement of the self, then... He said, he never said, you will find this, you will discover this, because that is not Krishnamurti. He said, you discover, sir, you find out what will happen if you, uh, if you watch the movement of the self uh, without judgment and without having any agenda and uh, without wanting to change it, 
because you may see jealousy you may see anger and you should not have the desire to change that jealousy to change that anger and you should just watch like a scientist is watching uh, using the microscope and using the telescope so that is krishna murthy's approach and as we keep watching then in my experience i found that the whole movement and activity of the self comes to an end and uh, and comes to an end and the process uh, in the krishna murthian paradigm is first of all uh, awakening uh, to sorrow that's the first thing and uh, then understanding sorrow how the whole phenomenon of sorrow is created and sustained and given continuity that's the stage 2 and the third stage is the ending of sorrow now i passed through all the three stages and this happened to me when i was 23 and i want to tell you that i parted company with sorrow at the age of 23 and it's never paid a visitation to me ever since i am 75 uh, uh, this year and um, i want to say that the thing became uh, very real to me and but you have to be sincere now who is the one who qualifies for this now if you have deep misfortunes in life every misfortune is actually a calling uh, you are asked to come back home every time there is a misfortune and if you are 60 65 you are again asked to reconnect to the divine reconnect to the source to come back home if you have had any kind of serious breakdown in life then it's a call for you to go back home so only at those times you can assimilate and absorb krishna murthy's paradigm shifted uh, teaching and that's the uh, that's a kind of nascent teaching and that gives you uh, uh, without studying the scriptures and i had to study the scriptures in order to find out what happened to me i did not study the scriptures uh, before that hmm? uh, and uh, my thing is i was in a huge boiling crisis my sense of self was dashed on the rocks of life to smithereens so i had a sense of self and that was the worldly self that was an ambitious self and that self was pulverized at that milestone of misfortune then uh, i had no option but to turn inward and watch the activity of the self so when i watched the activity of the self and i prioritized it not making my worldly life first priority and this sadhana second priority no i made this the first priority at the expense of being a loser in worldly life but uh, and then i found out the whole thing whatever i'm presenting to you uh, i found out that sorrow can end and then uh, you can have the vacant uh, mind you can you may not have the vacant mind uh, like krishna murti that is the work vacant mind from birth till death that is too much that happens only for a world teacher and you can have uh, a vacant mind for uh, shorter intervals of time uh, especially when a misfortune visits you and that is the time when you will make a discovery of the whole thing no belief belief has no place here and faith has no place here even though faith is something marvelous and uh, yesterday i happened to go to uh, the book uh, the hebrews and i uh, i read one sentence about faith and i was overjoyed even though i am telling all the people who are listening to me this is a journey beyond the milestone of faith and i read that faith is the substance of what is hoped for faith is the evidence of what is not yet seen so this is from the book of hebrews and uh, uh, obviously um, um, mother blavatsky uh, madam blavatsky uh, and uh, henry st lolcott must have had this faith that is uh, it is said that uh, with this faith you can move mountains together you can move mountains that's exactly what happened uh, at the genesis of the theosophical society and the power is still available for us the question is are we going to be passive and are, or are we going to uh, dare uh, to be uh, foolish enough and to be wise enough simultaneously uh, to go for the impossible so that's our assignment not just an assignment for the president now uh, for radha bernier the previous president and mr tim boyd who is in the chair uh, today but for all the people who have come to theosophy and for all the people who have come to krishna murti whether they can prioritize this learning and whether they can be completely open when there is a visitation by misfortune and know that the time has come so that's the time you can go home you cannot go uh, at uh, go home at any other time when life is happiness begetting life is pleasure begetting life is fulfillment begetting at that time you can't go back home the door will be closed you can only go back home after 65 uh, when um, uh, after 65 or when you have seen enough of life or 
uh, when a misfortune hits you like a thunderbolt, then you can go back home. That is the time that teaching becomes pertinent to you, teaching becomes uh, very relevant to you. And the whole process, the new paradigm is, uh, thank you, uh, is uh, uh, inward flowering through self-knowing. And the Theosophical Society's insistence and emphasis on universal intelligence uh, is an echo of what is in the scriptures and uh, uh, so need to push this forward. Uh, and in the scriptures, uh, in the Upanishads, as uh, Dr. Radha Raghunathan uh, already uh, emphasized, um, there, is, there is abundant testimony to the presence of universal intelligence. And uh, the Mahavakya is Pragyanam Brahma. That is, Godhead or the unmanifest divine, uh, how does it manifest itself? It manifests itself as universal intelligence. And that universal intelligence is available to all of us whenever you're deeply interested in something as a scientist, as a dancer, as a painter, as a mathematician, uh, as a businessman, you're deeply interested in something, then your consciousness becomes still, then there is a clearing. And in that clearing, the universal intelligence will begin to uh, erupt like a fountain in uh, uh, like thin threads, it will erupt and it will come in the form of insights and then that will sanctify your work and that will become uh, the central idea of your Nobel Prize winning work if you're a scientist or if you're a great artist, uh, something else. Now it's already active in everybody and the more silent we are, the more it is flowing. But it is so subtle that when it does flow, we may make the Himalayan mistake of saying, I am very intelligent and I got this insight. Now, that's not the case at all. It's a property of the divine. It, it's a fragrant breeze which has come from the realm of the unmanifest. It just came into your chamber because you were momentarily virtuous. Not always. Momentarily only. Hmm? And, and then, uh, then you become the recipient of that and you share that with the whole world. Now, uh, in the Upanishads, Prajnanam Brahma and David Bohm and uh, Krishnamurti's Conversations, 10 Dialogues on Rockwood Park in 1974, the published... Uh, dialogues are called Awakening of Intelligence, where Krishnamurti is constantly referring to this and uh, Krishnamurti said, unless you awaken to sorrow uh, this intelligence uh, will not, uh, uh, the gate won't open. You have to awaken to sorrow first. And awakening to sorrow means uh, the entire activity of the so-called mind and the self, it has to be shut down. Now when it is shut down once there is a moratorium, then uh, it may be imprisoned, the activity, for six months or three months or three years or ten years. Then again it will begin. Hmm? Again it will begin. Then again you need a second dying in Krishnamurti's parlance. You need a second dying, a third dying, so that you'll be ever young, you'll be ever fresh. And time and you are strangers. So now, uh, with the permission of uh, the international president, uh, I want to say... Uh, that uh, original founders of Theosophical Society, they achieved the impossible, and that can still be achieved uh, by the uh, present international president and by his predecessor, Radha Bernier, uh, who made uh, the thing of bringing Krishnamurti into the Theosophical Society compound, and he planted a tree uh, after long many years, many decades, and I was with Krishnaji on that occasion when he did the tree planting, and he went for a walk beside, uh, behind Parsi quarters, and I was with him, and he told me, sir, this is where they discovered me. I said, yes, Krishnaji, I'm aware of this. Now, uh, the, the challenge uh, for the international president is whether uh, he can make Krishnamurti's teachings the New Testament of the Theosophical Society and the, uh, and the infinite gamut of Theosophical literature, whether that can be presented to the world as the Old Testament so that there is one overarching uh, unifying paradigm. So that there is no chasm between the world teacher uh, for whom the founders work and there is uh, no inconsistency between the work of the Theosophical Society which is the preparation and what the world teacher achieved during 70 years of teaching. So that's my submission and uh, my, uh, my humble submission and I pray that the universal intelligence which is ever present in all of us and especially uh, in the president of the Theosophical Society because he, he is occupying that chair and because all the intelligence which operated in the founders will always be present in the present founder, in the present international president. It will be operational and, and uh, therefore 
uh, it is not just his responsibility. I think it's a responsibility for every one of us to see whether we can uh, bring that universal intelligence. Uh, uh, and the master, the world teacher, he opened the door for all of us, whether we can do justice and not be lethargic and passive, but set about, not that we know the way, we don't know the way, but still to set about, uh, to begin with groping in the dark and then uh, finding out that the journey is complete. Namaste. I would like to thank both speakers for their profound speeches. And it's really a challenge to conciliate Krishnamurti teachings with this ancient, ancient wisdom. Really a challenge. I would like to remember that he always pointed out that the word is not the thing. And in general, we be satisfied with words and we lose ourselves in words, including his words. I know some very followers of Krishnamurti that are repeating his words without understand, without experience by him or herself the thing he said. I think he pushes everyone to experience reality, but being free of any words. Of course, if we go to a profound level, all religions point for the same unity of life, including Krishnamurti. All of them point to that. And uh, as we are trying to understand in this convention what is universal intelligence and what is intellect, we need to know that intellect sometimes loses itself in words. Then we, we need to make try to make all simple to experiment this unity, this universal intelligence in our own lives. Uh, it's not a question of words. All teachings are real teachings. But the way we deal with them make all the difference. We need to make it simple. We need to go to the very profound sense of the teaching and be free of the teaching to really grow in spirituality. Then I would thank both speakers for this big effort. And uh, it's up to each one of us to, to make our own effort. The president himself cannot... Uh, say, well, the new theosophy is this. This is impossible. Because the openness of the theosophical society is that someone may think that Krishnamurti is the world teacher, and some other may think he's not. And the society is open for all. If, if we, we adopt someone position, some position, we will exclude the others that have other belief or other way of thinking, then it's very important to, to keep this openness of the Theosophical Society. I think Sri Ram brought Krishnamurti teaching to the society, but not as an official teaching, but as his understand and his experience. Hada did the same, but it's up to everyone not uh, as an official thing to be delivered to the members uh, around the world. Then thank you to the speakers, and uh, this session is closed. <laughs>